um, what would like to put in the chat um, where you're, what town you're from, um, please feel free to do that. And if you already know that you have questions for our panelists, also please feel free to type those in the chat and we'll get to them um, when we can. Okay, well, I think it is 1.30, and so we will get started. We are starting each session uh, with a land acknowledgement, so I will begin with that. We recognize that the land and water now under our care is the traditional and ancestral territory of the Lene Lenape. We pay respect to the Lenape peoples, past, present, and future, and their continuing presence in the homeland and throughout the Lenape diaspora. We respect their knowledge, culture, and tradition, which have contributed to the conservation of land and water. We also acknowledge that historic white supremacy and environmental racism practices have caused disrupt disproportionate environmental and climate impacts on people of color and overburdened communities. The Watershed Institute pledges to work for clean water and a healthy environment, including in communities that have been unjustly affected by systemic racism and environmental pollution. We would like to extend a special thanks to our fifth annual Watershed Conference sponsors, and those include Princeton Hydro, Lake Hapericong Foundation, and the Musconetcong Watershed Association. So thank you very much to them. And we have three speakers here with us today, and I um, welcome them and thank them for coming. And Lisa, why don't you uh, share your screen while I am um, just reading a little bit about each one of you. So Lisa Rosati, who will be speaking first, is a New Jersey licensed tree expert. Um, and she has spent 20 years working for both private and municipal clients performing environmental impact studies, wetland delineations, threatened and endangered species surveys, tree inventories, securing grants for land preservation, tree planting projects, and inventories. She has written several municipal ordinances for the protection of trees and endangered species, and she consults as a New Jersey licensed tree expert to assist municipalities with their community forestry management plans. So she is going to be, as is indicated on her presentation, um, giving us the basics on best practices for an effective tree protection ordinance. Then we also have here with us Taylor Sepudar, and he's also a New Jersey licensed tree expert, uh, and he is the Princeton's municipal arborist. Taylor attended Mercer County Community College for Ornamental Horticulture and Rutgers University for Environmental Planning. He's currently enrolled in a master's program at Oregon State University for Urban Forestry. He's been an adjunct instructor in the horticulture department at Mercer County Community College an arborist for a nationally known tree company and worked for an engineering firm that worked directly with the New York City Parks Department. And he does an amazing job for Princeton. So really glad to have him here to talk about um, the basics of enforcing it and, and working with uh, a protective tree ordinance. And lastly, we'll hear from Patricia Shanley, PhD. She has 30 years of experience researching the value of forests to local livelihoods and integrating traditional knowledge with science to empower communities in the Amazon, Indonesia, and also works with inner city youth in the forests of New Jersey. She currently works for People and Plants International, the intergovernmental platform for biodiversity and ecosystem services, and directs a forest stewardship program for youth with the Ridgeview Conservancy. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Lisa. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Today, as Sophie said, I'm gonna discuss some of the best practices for an effective tree protection ordinance. Uh, the entire scope of creating a tree protection ordinance would exceed my time limit for today, but I wanna discuss things that are very important to consider when drafting a new ordinance or making revisions to a current ordinance. 
Now the recommendations I've included are based on my experience over the last 20 years. And I did spend a few years in the private sector complying with ordinances before working solely for municipalities where I reviewed applications and permits and have written ordinances. My screen is not moving forward. There we go. Everybody saw the next screen, correct? Hopefully. Did this advance? I just wanna make sure as I started. Yes? Yeah. Terrific, thank you. <clears throat> okay. So first, I wanna start at the beginning because in order to have an effective ordinance, you have to actually adopt an ordinance. I've seen tree ordinances stall for years in some towns because they become too controversial. So first, I just wanna talk about why it's important to actually protect our tree resource. And just about everyone, even young children, could list at least a few of the benefits that trees provide. Each of these are incredibly important benefits. If you remember back to your biology class, trees take in carbon dioxide and water and they turn it into sugar and oxygen. That carbon is sequestered in all the tree's biomass, which means the trunk, the branches, the leaves and the roots. So if that was the only things that trees did, it would be a wonderful thing, but they do so much more. They help prevent erosion, they alleviate flooding, they provide buffers, they reduce pollution, they provide health benefits and many more things. So at least some of these benefits should be included in the intent and purpose of your ordinance. Now, with all those benefits, you'd think a tree protection ordinance would be supported by everyone, but that's usually not the case. So you'll often run into some resistance and even some anger from residents when you discuss having a tree protection ordinance in your town. The biggest arguments, and I've heard them a lot, are usually, it's my property, I'm paying high taxes, and I can do what I want on my own property. They don't want anybody telling them what they can do. Now that's all understandable that people get upset by the additional rules and requirements on their property, and that they may have to spend more money or pay fees, but it's really important. So don't give up, it can be done. <laughs> First, you need support from your governing body to allow you to draft a protective ordinance. The more support you get from municipal volunteer boards like Shade Tree, environmental commissions, that type of thing, local groups and residents, the better. I found one of the best ways to get an ordinance working properly is to provide public education and awareness. Now I've given you a few suggestions of how you can achieve that on this slide. But based on your own municipality, come up with your best ideas that you can for educating your residents about the importance of tree protection and explain that the ordinance you're creating is for the betterment of your town, for the environment, and for their children. Now, obviously not all municipalities are the same. There are differences in lot sizes, pervious coverage, existing tree species, site planting restrictions such as soil types and salinity, just to name a few. You know your town the best, so you have to prepare the ordinance that best suits your town. Are there areas in your town that should have additional protection such as steep slopes, endangered species habitat or riparian areas? If so, make sure to address these in your ordinance. Check your existing tree resource. What's the current overall health of your trees? is there diversity in your existing tree species? Diversity is very important. So for example, the overuse of a tree like an ash tree throughout neighborhoods, it's now a problem because the emerald ash borer is killing off all the ash trees. That not only causes expensive removals and possible replacements, but it also is a loss of mature trees that are capable of providing more oxygen, sequestering more carbon, and all the other benefits than a young tree can for many years. If you have historic or herded trees in your town, consider extra protection of those trees. Now, in case you're not familiar with a heritage tree, I did explain it, but the tree has to be a certain DBH for that specific species. So the example that I provided is just to show you that difference in size. Now to qualify as a heritage tree, a scarlet oak would have to be say 25 inches in diameter. When I say DBH, that's four and a half feet from the ground. So a scarlet oak is 25 inch DBH, but a tulip poplar at the same measurement would be 40 and a half inches. If you aren't sure about heritage trees and you're interested in them, I can point you to Freehold Township. If you look at Freehold Township's existing heritage tree ordinance, they have heritage tree standards, and I do know those standards were prepared 
years ago by a group of tree experts, foresters, and that type of thing. So that's a good one to reference. But as I said, you know your town, so you want to write the ordinance that works best for your individual town. There's some important things to keep in mind when preparing your ordinance. And one of the reasons I say, you'll hear me say a couple of things, is you, you, the more your ordinance is challenged, the more complicated it gets. So you want to try to keep that in mind when you're writing the ordinance. So if you bias the ordinate, ordinance against proposed development, you open it up to litigation. This has happened to other towns, and they've lost lawsuits. As far as saying flat out no to a tree removal, I don't recommend that particularly when it's in close proximity to a house, a building, a playground, that type of thing. Whenever we as tree experts do tree risk assessments, one of the most important factors is always, what is the potential target if the tree fails? If you deny a removal and it causes property damage or worse, the town will likely face litigation, not to mention be part of a tragedy. So instead consider offering an option such as allowing that removal but requiring tree replacements be planted in a more suitable area. Make your ordinance clear for the reviewer and for enforcement. So for example, you might say a tree with a DBH between six to 10 inches that's proposed to be removed would require a replacement tree with a minimum caliper of two and a half inches be planted, that type of specifics. When you're referring to trees, it's always easiest to refer to the industry standards of measurement. So you would use DBH, diameter at breast height, which is measured at four and a half feet from the ground. That's for really for existing trees, established trees. Or you use caliper when you're talking about landscape stock. That's measured one foot from the ground. Now, in some areas, tree removal shouldn't be allowed, with the exception, always with the exception of a tree that poses a threat to public safety or property. So consider adding restricted areas in your ordinance. I've listed some here. So wetlands and their transition areas, as well as threatened and endangered species habitat are regulated by the DEP. But you might not necessarily know that they exist on private property unless it's shown on a survey. And most typical surveys don't show that. So the DEP would not likely know someone cleared trees in a regulated area unless it was in plain sight or if they received a complaint. So during, re during review of a new development, like a proposed development, potential wetlands and threatened and endangered species habitat should be checked by both the applicant's engineer and the municipal engineer who reviews your plan or their plan. But on existing development, the property would need to be checked for wetlands by the person or TNA habitat, by the person that's designated by your municipality to do the review of these applications. For example, a forester, a tree expert, a zoning officer, an engineer, so that's an important thing to check just because you might not know it's on proper, private property. And then you can say that it's not allowed. You don't have to allow it. They'd have to get DEP approval. That's one way to save those trees. Same thing, conservation easements and other deed restricted areas may have specific language that restricts tree removal. Conservation easements and deed restricted areas should be shown on a survey. They might not be, but they should be. I highly recommend requiring a survey for tree removal applications especially those where multiple trees are being removed. If one person wants to take, if you, it depends on how you write your ordinance, but if somebody is just going to be taking out one tree near their house, you know, you might not need a, a survey, but for most cases you would want it. A great way to protect your tree resource is to request conservation easements on new development. So discuss this with your governing body and your planning and zoning boards. The DEP also regulates tree clearing within riparian zones. Prohibit tree removal in riparian areas, and if possible, consider extending the buffer to protect our water resources. And tree removal on steep slopes should also be restricted. Now, steep slopes should be defined within your land use ordinance to know what the percentage is to be qualified as a steep slope. Also, when new development is proposed, it's usually reviewed by the municipal, uh, municipal planning or zoning board. Tree removal should be prohibited on the property until the applicant has received final approvals from that board, planning or zoning. The reason for this is often the plan is changed, which may change the location of where trees need to be removed, or the permit can, or the application could be denied. So in that case, no trees should have been removed. 
I've seen this in a town where an applicant started clearing his property before the board made their final decision. The application was denied, but all the trees were already removed. So of course, tree replacements were required, but again, healthy, mature trees were replaced with very young, much smaller trees. As far as tree removal and replacements. As far as tree removal on private property, determine what the minimum size a tree would be to require a replacement and the number and size of the trees required as that replacement. Consider an equivalent dollar amount for the replacement tree if the owner doesn't want to plant the tree on their own property. That replacement dollar amount could be collected in a municipal tree fund which would be used for tree planting or other tree related activities on municipal property. Require a tree removal plan that shows the location, the number, the species, and the size of the trees proposed for removal. When I say size, I mean DBH. Require the trees proposed for removal are marked in the field with flagging so that a reviewer can go out and easily identify which trees are proposed for removal. Require a tree replacement plan or a landscape plan that shows the proposed planting location of replacement trees, as well as the size and species that's proposed. Now I highly recommend, and a lot of towns don't do this, that a final inspection of the installed replacement species by that designated municipal representative, the forest or the tree expert, whoever, just to ensure that the planting has actually happened. And once you go and verify that the trees have been planted, then close out the application. This way we're sure that actually the tree replacements are being planted and properly. Now, for landscaping standards, I highly recommend you prepare a municipal list of recommended tree species. Include details such as mature heights and site requirements to ensure that the right tree will be chosen for the right location. Recommend the use of native species. Include a list of invasive species that are prohibited as replacement species or proposed landscaping for new development. Provide proper planting techniques and aftercare to help ensure tree survival. Encourage diversity in species. Now, these lists of species and proper techniques don't have to be inserted into the ordinance, but you can reference them within them, within it. The information should be readily available on the municipal website, available at town hall, included with the tree removal application. New development will have additional landscaping requirements that we don't have time to discuss, but those landscape plans are generally prepared by landscape architects who are familiar with all the general requirements. So as far as tree preservation, one of the most important aspects is to require tree protection fencing. Tree protection fencing protects trees from accidental removal, from mechanical injury from the machinery that's on site, from soil compaction, from soil or fill being stockpiled on roots, and equipment storage. Every one of those practices can kill trees. Sometimes it may take about five years for the tree to die from these activities. And by that time, the developer is probably off their bond so they aren't responsible to replant trees. But tree protection should be required for all tree save areas for new development and existing development that has proposed construction. For example, if the homeowner is putting in a swimming pool, there'll be a backhoe or an excavator on site digging the hole and stockpiling the soil. Any trees that are proposed to remain need that tree fencing to protect them. For all tree save areas, it is essential that the fencing be installed prior to any site work and remain standing in good condition until the construction is finished. Talk to your building inspectors and other staff who frequent the site so they can check on it. The fencing should be installed outside of the tree canopy or the critical root zone to protect the tree, whichever is further away from the tree trunk. For new development, I highly recommend that the location of the tree protection fencing, the notation and details are all shown on the grading plan. Typically, on a set of plans, it's almost always shown on the landscape plan, but the contractor who does all the site work, they're not looking at the landscape plan. They refer mostly to the grading plan. You can list other prohibited acts to protect trees, existing trees. I've provided a few examples that are commonly found in tree protection ordinances. It may not seem like much, but changing the grade by adding a little over an inch of soil on a root zone can kill a tree. Again, a lot of times it takes about five years for that tree to die. It'll start declining before that. 
Some of these would be hard to enforce, I recognize, on private property, but if you can discourage it, it's beneficial. So here's another topic where public education can be very helpful. Your town may have properties that should be exempt from the ordinance in regard to tree removal and replacement requirements. Again, this is about challenges to your ordinance. If the applicant has an approved NJDEP forest management plan, tree removal is frequently part of the plan with practices such as thinning and harvesting. This doesn't apply to all towns, but to many of us around here. Qualifying commercial farms are exempt under the Right to Farm Act. You may want to exempt the removal of a dead, diseased, or high-risk tree, although tree replacement is always encouraged. Okay, and at the end, I did put, I've added the electric utility companies as a suggestion. And in full disclosure, about 15 years ago, I spent two years as a utility forester for an electric company. That's why I put the Star Wars logos on there because it's as a joke, because people always kidded me that I'd gone over to the dark side. Some towns did try to make the utility comply with their ordinance, but usually over 99% of the time, electric utility companies have rights of ways and easements that specifically, specifically state that they have the right to remove, destroy, prune, and spray trees within that easement. So officially, legally, they can do it. They do need to maintain minimum clearances for safety and reliability. We all hate the look of the pruning by the wires, but when trees grow near the wires, they'll be pruned, electric wires. In addition to the reliability of the issue, consider safety. On one occasion, I found a tree house that had been built in a tree that was touching the electric wires. Thankfully, it was early in the season and no kids had been climbing in it yet, but kids also climb trees. So the clearance is very important. What I would recommend is when you review proposed replacement tree plantings, please refrain from allowing trees that can grow in conflict near these wires to be planted there. You can recommend tree species that would be okay to plant in close proximity to wires. And if you need help with that, you can look at your electric company's website for their recommended tree species list. Now, of course, you'll need to add sections on the review and enforcement, as well as establish fees and penalties for violations. These are gonna depend on your town. So I won't go into much detail on this topic. Your next speaker is going to be addressing this issue anyway. So. But I did want to provide a link to the NJDEP GEO webpage where you can check a location for potential wetlands or threatened endangered species habitat, that type of thing. You can put in an address and it will come up. You can pull up the satellite picture and then you can drop layers on top of it, wetlands and threatened endangered species habitat. And then you can check to see what's even there, like if it's barred how habitat, that type of thing. So it's a great resource to be able to check those, excuse me, those properties. And I also wanna point out as far as violations and penalties go, that in your ordinance, you can, you can make every tree that's removed a separate violation. And that's an important thing to do. Okay, so now I just want a quick disclaimer. I'm obviously not an attorney and I've just worked with these ordinance for many years, but your draft ordinance should be reviewed by your municipal attorney before adoption. And also, as I mentioned, Try to garner that support and awareness of the ordinance from other departments and groups in your town to make it more effective. Trees really can make a difference. So I thank you for your time and your interest and I'll be available for questions at the end, I guess. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, Lisa. Um, and thanks to all of you who are, have joined us. Um, I work with some of you and I know that some of you are um, would love to work with your towns to have a, a stronger ordinance and Lisa is a, a great uh, person to talk to about this so please don't be shy about um, putting your questions in the chat and we also can unmute you if you um, want to raise your hand and um, while you're thinking about your questions um, I am uh, gonna ask um, Taylor a few questions um, about Princeton, because Princeton has a very protective tree ordinance. And when we work with local government here at the watershed to advocate for strong tree protection ordinances, sometimes there's a lot of concern about how the municipal staff is going to feel about it, how much time it's going to take, how many resources. And so I just thought that Taylor would be um, a great person to talk to about that. Um, so maybe just to start um, just by some of the provisions of the um, Princeton ordinance, like the requirement um, to get a permit for trees on private property, which is something that obviously Lisa is recommending. And 
and how um, how you how you um, work with uh, homeowners on that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So any any tree removed in Princeton over the diameter or the DBH of eight inches requires a permit. Uh, as per New Jersey state law, um, anybody removing a tree must be a New Jersey licensed tree expert, unless or, or a New Jersey New Jersey licensed tree care operator, unless of course you're a homeowner doing private tree work on your own private property. So when a tree removal permit comes into my office, I'm considered the enforcement officer. I deal with all the vegetation within our right of way and then the tree removal inspections um, of tree replacement plan is required for any live tree over that eight inches in diameter. So the reason why we, we require a tree replacement plan is this way it deters a larger 30 inch caliper oak being removed for development purposes and then the applicant wanting to replace it with three dogwoods. Um, as per our ordinance, if a large mature shade tree comes down, we want to keep the same uh, canopy cover throughout town. So we would want to see a two and a half inch caliper uh, shade tree to be replaced based off the size of the tree. If it was a 30 inch caliper tree, we would need three trees replaced for that, so on and so forth. But just to reiterate, um, a two and a half inch caliper tree is not going to replace a 30 inch diameter oak tree. So when they can be preserved in the construction process, I highly recommend it, um, not only for the environmental benefits, but also the um, the cost, of, the cost value that it does for a residence and for the town itself. I mean, a mature shade tree can be valued 10, 20, $30,000 in some instances of property value. Um, and there's a comment in the uh, chat, penalties are often not strong enough to cause compliance. How stiff can we reasonably make penalties? Um, I guess Lisa, I might throw that one back to you. Okay. I have had conversations with attorneys actually just recently. So your town may have a fines section or fees section that you would have to comply with. But if you make them have to comply with the replacement section of that ordinance. So say you took down that 30 inch tree and you were required to plant three, two and a half inch trees. As I said before, if you come up also with a tree dollar value that would equal to uh, three, two and a half inch caliper trees, the person really didn't want to put the trees on their property, you could plant them on municipal property. It's not ideal, but it's, it's better than none. So you could hold them to that ordinance. They have to plant the trees or put that money to the fund. And then the additional fee would be if they didn't want to do it, they would go to, an uh, to the court and the judge would decide the penalty. That's why saying every tree is an, a separate offense is a really good idea in your ordinance. Otherwise, if you took down 15 trees, for example, and you just said, well, too bad, and your fee for the town is like a $2,000 fine as the maximum, it would only be $2,000. It'd be a lot cheaper to do, pay that fine than to put in all those trees. So if this way, if it's every single tree has it separate, it would be $2,000 per tree that the judge would be able to um, charge you. So Thank I, you. I can comment for yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, Princeton, the way we determine the value of what a two and a half inch caliper shade tree is, is we've taken the average of what it costs for a contractor to plant a tree on one of our spring and fall replacement contracts um, when we do our municipal plantings in the spring and fall. So that, that dollar amount is $550 per two and a half inch caliper tree. So in the event that a 20 inch um, maple was removed without permission, um, that would be 550 times two, so $1,100 would be the fine that we would implement for that. But I'd also like to say that every scenario is different. So I, I've had instances where a dead ash tree is removed. Uh, there was a new contractor who was licensed but didn't know the ordinance in town, and I didn't feel comfortable penalizing someone for taking down what was clearly a, a dead ash tree. So every scenario is different, but in in the event that a, a fine needs to be implemented, that's what I use, the five, $550 times whatever the size of that tree is. Now, there are studies done by the U.S. Forest Service that can, if you can measure the stump, that'll give you a diameter of breast height. So I've always used that formula, documented it with pictures um, to, to just have a track record of how that fine was implemented. Um, okay, so here's another question. Does anyone have in their ordinance or ENO that developers have to take precautionary measures not to damage trees 
the property owner intends on keeping. Often large equipment will compact the ground near a tree and eventually lead to its death. Putting down planks for staying clear of the tree cover perimeter is helpful. Do you want me to, am I still answering okay. that, Sophie? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, that's where that tree replacement require the tree protective fencing is is vital because that that can stop all that when you install it beyond that critical root zone I, it'd be great if if it was even further than that but there's only so far we can push if you if you push the tree protection fencing outside the critical root zone or the canopy cover you will be preventing that soil coming in the compaction the machinery hitting it all that type of thing but it has to be that's why in your ordinance, you have to clearly state that it's gotta be installed prior to any site work. So, cause if it's not, you know, if they start just a little bit of site work, it's already too late. And to, to have that tree protection detail on the submitted plans, the zoning and engineering, um, that's, that's a must do as well, just because it gives um, a reference to the contractor when they're in violation of, of the ordinance. One thing that I found was helpful for me is because we have a tree protection ordinance, um, a tree protection ordinance, but the, the language in municipal ordinances can be very difficult to comprehend. Um, so what I like to do is to put it in an easy read uh, PDF that I can distribute to our homeowners because a lot of times I've dealt with residents that didn't know that was um, not only an ordinance, but that a, track or backhoe sitting in the drip line is a problem. But now if there's an easy to read document that they know, they can almost act as um, a, a second pair of eyes. Um, the, one of the major problems I have is um, enforcement being that I do weekly inspections of the projects that we have going on in town, but I can arrive on a Monday and the tree protection fence is set up. Everything looks fine, it's, a, it's, you know, it's to spec. But then on Tuesday, the masonry contractor um, does the foundation. It's a hot day. He wants to park underneath the tree. And now it's moved and he's mixing concrete in the drip line that can ultimately damage the roots and the treads of the backhoe can do that as well. So constant um, inspections is key to, to keep this enforcement. Um. Something else I, I had asked Taylor um, before we started, and I, I think it's worth repeating because I was... Uh, speaking with an environmental commission recently, um, and they were report, reporting repeated instances of contractors coming into a municipality not being aware of the ordinance, at least saying they weren't aware of the ordinance and taking down uh, a lot of trees, um, which then of course it's done. So um, I know Princeton has a requirement um, to register with the municipality. Um, and I know you said that there is now a state requirement also, so maybe you could just explain that to everybody. Sure, there's um, the New Jersey licensed tree expert. Um, to, to, to do licensed tree work in New Jersey, you need to be a licensed tree care operator or an LTE. So it's very similar to being a private plumber or having a license to be a plumber, electrician, et cetera. You now need to have a license to do tree work in the state of New Jersey. It is not a municipal ordinance. It's not a municipal law, it's a state law. So when we have permits that come through my office, we need to know who the contractor is and they need to provide their uh, NJ LTCO number or their LTE license number. Um, what that does is that shows that they're in compliance with the state. Um, that shows that they have workman's comp, they have insurance to work um, and they're not a fly by night company just trying to, to do work. And part of maintaining that license is to do um, continuing education credits, 32 credits every two years. Um, the continuing education credits can be on um, proper pruning techniques, uh, rigging, uh, plant identification, insect disease management. So to stay compliant, the contractors need to do um, 32 credits every two years and that, that keeps everyone up to date. Taylor, I also wanted to ask you, um, if you were an environmental commission designing an ordinance, um, are there things that, um, just based on your experience working with Princeton's ordinance that you would suggest, or what, what advice would you have for a municipality, let's say, who doesn't have protections yet on private property? Um, I would consult with a, um, a licensed tree expert that has experience in writing community forestry management plans. Um, it can be um, 
over if you have no ordinance at all, it can be very overwhelming to, to where to start. So um, licensed tree experts that are that have worked in with community forest and management plans and writing ordinances is, is, is where I would um, where I would start. The state of New Jersey offers grants for communities that don't have um, a community forest management plan to hire a um, experienced LTE or LTCO to, to write that. So I would explore grant opportunities in order to hire a professional to to start writing the ordinance. And I have a question for you, Lisa, which is, uh, I was reading, I think it's called a, it's a sustainable development um, group that was uh, recommending an ordinance that would target a percentage of your tree canopy. So let's say, um, you know, that you decided that it was important for your town to retain a 40% tree canopy coverage. Is there anything like that going on in this state or not? Not that I know of. I have had people approach me about it. Honestly, that's a much more difficult thing to quantify because it would depend on the year. The reason we do, we work with um, diameters of tree as far as measurement and how many trees on the site, that type of thing, is because it's very simple. You can do it in the winter time, anything else. So the canopy coverage is, is just a very difficult measurement. Um, I don't know if Taylor has any, but I, I haven't seen any that way. I haven't seen any. Okay, well, I think now we're going to take a different uh, look at uh, how to think about protecting our trees. And we have Dr. Patricia Shanley here with us, and she has prepared a video that we are going to show, and then we can do some more question and answer. Very much thank you to John Smith, who is our tech here for helping us with that. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak. Today, we will learn about what makes old growth forests remarkable, global and local initiatives to conserve them, and clues on how to recognize them. We will also hear from young students working hard to save old trees. Here we see forests 8,000 years ago compared to present day forest cover. Estimates indicate that since the last ice age, we have lost one third of global forest. Can you click the notes? We don't need some of the notes. An area twice the size of the United States. Here in the US, over the last 400 years, we see the same trend. Rapid deforestation of old growth forest, leaving less than 1% on the East Coast and 4% on the West Coast. Here we see Manhattan today as compared to 1609 when Henry Hudson landed. At the time, Native Americans lived on the island along with wolves, mountain lions, elk, deer, and beaver. Manhattan represents a microcosm of a global trend, one species, people, taking over finite land resources while destroying biodiverse rich and climate cooling forests, a global land squeeze. Experts predict but to feed, fuel, and shelter, there's 10 billion people in 2050. Agricultural land will need to expand by over 600 million hectares, an area twice the size of India. And unless forests remain standing, the world will never contain global warming. Delegates at the climate conference in Glasgow this week made a pledge to end deforestation. To do so, protected areas must be expanded, roads, development, and industry avoided and still intact for us, and the territorial rights of indigenous peoples must be recognized. To accomplish this, global scientific consensus has led to a policy called 30 by 30, protecting 30% 30 of the Earth's land and waters by 2030. Given their biodiversity and enormous ecosystem service values, forests, particularly older growth, should be a key part of this 30%. Now let's look at old growth forests. Traditionally, old growth signified original, uncut forests many hundreds of years old. Today, old growth is so rare in some regions, it may be characterized as 120 to 150 year old forest. Whatever definition we use, it's imperative that we identify stands of forest reaching maturity and protect them so that one day we will have old forest again. How do we recognize an old growth forest? 
Old growth forests in the Northeast generally do not appear as forest cathedrals like those out West. Older growth forests are messy with canopy gaps, fallen trees, and some big old standing trees scattered throughout a mix of understory species. These fallen trees create a bed of rich nutrients in topsoil, which store carbon and filter water. Trees also capture particulate matter and pollutants from the air, regulate air temperature, and mitigate flooding. Worldwide, between 2007 and 2016, intact forests absorbed around 28% of all carbon dioxide emissions, a huge reduction of planet warming gas. Old forests store magnitudes more carbon than young forests, and we need to remember that old forests are rare and irreplaceable. Older forests are far more complex than anything in your computers. They are a tapestry of life forms, home to an astonishing array of genetic diversity, biological legacies, symbiotic microarousal networks, and architectural and functional complexity. These unique structures and characteristics provide habitat for animal and plant species, such as birds, bats, lichens, and mammals, which are not found in any other forest types. Trees in old growth forests may display certain characteristics, such as few large, twisty limbs at the top, no tapering of the trunk, hollow chambers, and balding bark. These are not flaws or defects. They are signs of a good old age, trees wisely weathering decades of ice, windstorms, drought, and disease. To recognize an old, old growth forest, you should leave your phone in the car. Simply look carefully for cool clues, like tip-ups, pillows and cradles, deadfalls and live snaps, nurse logs and wind tips. You need to stop, open your eyes, and read the landscape. Here we see a tip-up and the cavity or cradle is formed where children are exploring. In spring, that cradle may become a vernal pond and habitat for amphibians. Over years, the exposed roots become a pillow or mound. These result in an undulating topography which can distinguish old growth forest. By contrast, Young forests may grow swiftly out of a flat farm field, revealing little to no undulation on the forest floor. Remarkably, here in the heart of New Jersey, is a 65-acre tract of never-cut old growth in Mettler's Woods, right down the road in Somerset. There, the average age of white oak trees is 235 years, and there are traces of indigenous forest management of the Lenape, who used fire as a forest management tool. We also can't beat forests for comprehensive health care. Walking in the woods offers a full body tune up for your endocrine, cardiovascular, respiratory, and nervous systems. Our jitters and depression diminish, and our immune boosting and anti cancer cells get to work. Many research studies show that forests also invigorate our brains. Rather than placing kids on overdrive in enrichment classes, parents may learn from their own parents who said the four magic words go outside and play. In Scandinavia, Korea, and Japan, medical doctors are writing scripts reiterating the same advice, go to the woods and play. The First Aid and Rescue Squad offers us life support systems and emergency medical care. We would never tear down Princeton's Rescue Squad building and fire the EMT team. And likewise, we should not allow our remaining old growth forests to be logged, as they are also rescuers in our midst. As Joni Mitchell says, let's not wait until they pave paradise and put in a parking lot. Each of us needs to anticipate threats to forest, stand up, and speak for the trees. For example, the two forests in blue in the upper right and left hand corners of this map are designated in Princeton's master plan as proposed open space. Yet these remarkable old growth forests became slated for housing developments. This year, Princeton and county and state officials, along with conservation organizations, banded together to protect these woods as part of Princeton's Emerald Necklace Initiative. The idea is to create a ring of interconnected forest parks around town. Fortunately, an agreement was reached to conserve the magnificent 153-acre forest tract shown here. Our consortium 
including the Watershed Institute, is now working on protecting the stunning, stunning 90 acre eastern tract near Herringtown Woods. The next phase of work will be finalizing sidewalks and bikeways to downtown so that all can have access to and enjoy the many benefits these forests offer. These forests are also home to numerous endangered and threatened species and are wildlife corridors to our neighboring communities in Montgomery and Hopewell. But how will we manage these forests, remove invasive species, and create and maintain trails? One way is by engaging energetic students. Over the past eight years, over 150 Princeton High students have stewarded 60 acres of a newly created forest reserve called Ridgeview Woods. By removing invasive species and planting natives, these students directly tackle biodiversity loss and climate change, global problems that must be acted upon locally. After a whole year of deadening classes on Zoom, there's nothing like shared hard work outdoors in mud, rain, and snow to build camaraderie, gain a sense of accomplishment, and have fun. However, in today's world, lack of access to forests and the penetration of technology into children's lives has caused an unprecedented rupture between children and nature. Without a link to nature, children can wither. For this reason, Ridgeview Conservancy has initiated the Emerald Necklace School Consortium to support schools interested in having their students actively store their schoolyard and a piece of the Emerald Necklace nearby. Children are naturals in invasive species strike teams when they are given license to destroy entire tracts of stilt grass, barberry, and bittersweet, they do so with gusto. For decades, I have been very fortunate to work in the Brazilian Amazon with forest farmers, hunter-gatherers, and their families. My friend, Senor Breish, the village clan there on the right, and his son, Kurumi, and village children are pictured here. Kurumi is looking up at a multi-use picia fruit tree. He has names for many of the trees in his forest, which he knows intimately as friends. Here, children and adults are closely connected with nature and vigorously alive. When rainforests are threatened, children and their families are known to band together to protect them. Here in the US, we can learn from our Brazilian friends. We can no longer take forests or the health of our children for granted. We need to quench their thirst for nature, get them off their screens and into the woods. The youth of today, saving trees for tomorrow. To conclude and summarize the importance of old growth forests, let's hear from Ridgeview Conservancy's trailblazing volunteers from Princeton High, known as the Ridgeview Turtles. So these are the Ridgeview Turtles, and they're going to summarize why old growth forests are important. Nick. Because it cools down the air, it regulates the temperature, and it acts as the wind break. They create fungal networks which and help the signal trees and filter through air. Because they create topsoil and store carbon. Trees store water and prevent flooding. Because they create and filter water and produce oxygen. Because they provide habitat for many endangered species. Because they create homes for species diminishing in numbers in their woods. They also create habitat for biodiversity. It makes homes for wildlife. Old forests produce food for us as well as the animals. They create eye-catching wild food fruit that used to feed the woolly mammoths and nutrient-rich fruit like persimmons. They can have hidden histories. They can nurture culture for hundreds of years. They can also decrease crime rates. They can also diminish depression and the blue shower immune system. They foster creativity and inspire all. And you know. Thank you, Trish, for that wonderful and inspirational video. I just uh, love that. Um, and um, I, I want to just ask you, Trish, because in Princeton, we have lots of groups who are working on open space and open space maintenance. Um, but I've really learned from you about the focus on starting with what's oldest. Um, and so do you have advice for people in their communities who might be trying to look and, and find out where that is? And, yeah, I think um, the next decade is by the UN is the year of restoration. 
but I think all of us need to look at protection first because it will always have for decades, we're gonna have a lot to restore, but we have left very little bits of older forests to protect. And to protect those, we need to ensure in great invasive species aren't invading them. And so getting out early in front of those invasive species and the New Jersey <coughs> Invasive Species Strike Force is a great place to learn from and a great website to go to. I think it's important to look where you have older growth forests, um, the big trees, beech trees, there's certain signals and signs of an older growth versus a younger forest. And it's important to identify those and get young people or your families into those like you've done at Woodfield Reserve to learn those invasive species. The good news is you only need to learn seven, eight, right? There's not that many, but as they infiltrate, they gain ground very quickly. So if we can um, cut them off at the pass early on, that's critical to do. And I think all of us need to identify these places. One, we need to identify older growth forests who are not protected and make sure we protect them. That's number one. And none of our climate change initiatives will pay off unless we save forests. And that's not well understood. We tend to go for human-centric changes when we have magic outside. The trees are like magic, what they can do in terms of flooding and air conditioning and uh, for human health benefits. So let's first save what we have and then let's go into forests that need assistance to be restored pull out the invasive and allow them to have the ecosystem service value that will be degraded if we allow the invasive species to take over. Invasives also don't provide the kind of food, the nutritional food, they're sort of like junk food. So if they're not as sustaining or nurturing, for example, for tropical migrating songbirds, you know, when we lose spice bush that has lipids full of really important oils that help our tropical migrating songbirds get home to South America. So as we degrade the understory with these other species that are not from here, we really diminish our wildlife diversity at all. So it's all connected. And I heard both of you um, emphasize the importance of engaging the community. So I guess maybe um, Taylor, if, if you have any lessons learned on reaching out to and engaging the community, and then Trish, if you could follow specifically focusing on engaging students. Just to tap into all the local resources, um, Princeton with FOPOs and the, um, the relationship we've established with the watershed and Friends of Harrington Woods, there are so many um, local organizations just to introduce yourselves to if you're on um, a shade tree commission just to help spread the word of what um, whether an ordinance you're trying to imply or, or what, what work your particular group is doing. Um, so I, I would I would start with that. Um, I think that curriculum has changed in schools. So our you know young people spend most of their time in schools, and those curriculums have been changed markedly. And you graduate now out of high school without knowing one tree species. You may not know any wildlife species. This is. Uh, homogenization that leads to no link to your land. If you don't have a link to your land, you don't really care about nurturing it or saving it or protecting it. So we really need to think as families and as teachers and as organizations about how to link us with our land better. And um, there's nothing more fun for kids than getting wet and muddy and jumping in trees. And I think we curb that due to legal issues and for all sorts of reasons. And it cuts out one of the best phases and parts of childhood. So I think we all need to reinvigorate and we can do that through scouting or with our own families or through schools. And it's great to see that after a year and a half of this deadening culture, it's sort of a get out of jail um, uh, thing that we're giving them to say, would you like to join the Emerald Necklace School Consortium? They're all really interested because they need, they see that the children and young students and high school students need to get out of jail, just to be free and to learn something and feel a sense of accomplishment doing something physically. There's a lot less physical work on the part of young people today than there used to be also, and that has detrimental consequences. So being able to learn a few species and make a difference on a global issue, you know, invasive species are like the second most important um, detriment for 
uh, loss of e extinction and loss of species worldwide. And we can do something about it locally. So that feels really good for students and, um, and teachers. And it's not a lot to learn. And it's really, really satisfying. So I think it's a gift to our children. I think as adults, we have made a lot of decisions to destroy the earth. And they're based on greed and based on short-sightedness. And I think right now, the gift that we can give young people is to help them get back to nature and to give them some of the tools. We need intergenerational help for them to have the tools to be able to restore the earth so that they will have a better place to live. Uh, we have a question. I appreciate the importance of trees and forests and getting young people involved, but since they don't vote, how do we leverage them? By the time their voters and politicians listen, the land will be gone. What are your thoughts? I think if you're not young today, nobody listens to you. So I think they, even without voting, I think young people um, have a voice. And when you give them an opportunity to actually act on these issues, they take it. So I think for the Emerald Necklace Consortium and that initiative, the students we work with at Princeton High were really fundamentally important. They were an inspiration for it because we saw their interest in each of these and they can't vote and they couldn't really raise the many, you know, huge amounts of money needed to purchase these, but they were a spirited force behind it. I think locally that really helped. And I think there are many ways in which young people are making their voices heard, but because they're contained in a school with a curriculum that does not generally include the environment or climate change as central, they are hindered because they're running after SATs and uh, all these uh, special courses. So we need to liberate students from this nonsensical rush towards nowhere um, and allow them the time and expertise, and we need to give them some of those technical tools, like how to figure out how much carbon is in one forest versus another, and how to identify these species. So I think we need to step up to the plate. I think the young people are ready, and we need to give them the opportunity. Something that we um, did at the Watershed Institute during COVID, uh, when we were looking for ways to involve our volunteers and they couldn't come to our center was that we started something called the Community Watershed Advocate Program, which was basically uh, training community members about how local government worked and how they could advocate for the environment. And we were really surprised. Uh, I don't think we were expecting it that there were a lot of teenagers that were very interested. And um, as someone who goes to a lot of environmental commission meetings and town council meetings, when students show up and speak, um, it, it's very uh, compelling. Um, and I think we've also seen that in our town uh, with some planning board meetings even, um, when students have collected data to, to share, um, that is really um, gets, a lot of, gets a lot of attention. So I think they can be advocates, but they do need to understand, it's important to uh, know how your local government works, what decisions are being made and that, um, they have the ability to go up and, and make a comment if they would like. Um, so the Westfield Green Team is saying we have three students on our local green team. They are among our most active members. That is great to see. Um, so Michael's saying, he's asking Trish, how exactly were the students of course? I really want to learn how to be most effective with youth. So in this instance, the Princeton High School has a community service requirement, so they have to do 50 hours a year, but we have students already on 200, 300, 400 hours. So I think if high schools can have that type of requirement and there gets to be a spirited band of people involved, that's a great way. I also think that your local nature centers are a good way, the Environmental Commission, as Sophie mentioned, um, there's a sort of culture that we have developed. It's not just about taking the invasive species out, it's about learning the ecology of the forest and learning the history and the cultures of those who used to live there. So to respect the overall, and we definitely link it to the global issues. So they're not just out back weeding the woods, okay? This is, a, this is uh, embedded in what's going on. And I think, getting that educational part of it in and giving them agency, giving them the 
decision-making power to look at the woods and say, what does this mean to you? And what does that mean to you? And what is this sign that says no trespassing? You know, it's a homeowner's. What does that mean to the public to think broadly about access to forests and what that means to neighborhood and public health care? So we have discussion groups during each of our sessions and we have themes and the kids go into some depth about these. And I think it's really, really good to see them firing up about issues that they may not have a lot of time to talk about in school. I think it's also important to realize that a lot of these students have, uh, I think they're calling it climate anxiety now and, and some depression and that they um, are really hardened by the opportunity to do something positive. And what I had one student say to me, which really stuck with me was that through our program, she was able to connect with a lot of people in her community that were already working on these issues, but she didn't know that. And so then when she was connected to them, I think she felt um, much more confident in, in what she wanted to do um, to invest her time in taking care of the environment. And also she was more effective because now she was kind of part of the network. Yeah, yeah, it's an equalizing. I think Michael, what's really interesting about it, nobody is better or less in the woods. It, there's an equalizing feeling that comes through in the woods. It doesn't matter what you're wearing. It doesn't matter what you got on the SATs or which classes you're taking. Everybody's equal and we all work together towards a common goal. So I think it really takes off that stress and that layer of anxiety about school and college applications. The parents are thrilled. You know, they pick them up and they say, you know, my kid wants to wake up on Sunday morning now. <laughs> they go home rosy cheeked. And it's hard to believe that teenagers like want to work on the woods pulling out pricker bushes and they all get cut up and dirty and muddy. And um, it's real community service. It's not fake. It's like real hard labor, as you know. Um, all right, are there any other questions? Um, please feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, Lisa, do you have any, any parting words? Lisa, I might have caught you being mute. Yeah. Not really, I just joked, go plant some trees. But if you don't have a tree ordinance in your town, you really should start looking into doing it. I, I know many towns don't have them and, and they're, it's just a very important tool. Otherwise, people can just take down as many trees as they want. It completely changes the um, everything. Not only all the benefits of trees, it changes the neighborhoods, it changes the feel of it. And of course, it's, it's not good for the environment. So I really strongly encourage you to work with your governing bodies and try and your volunteer groups and see if you can get one off the ground. Thank you. Taylor, any last thoughts? Well, just to reiterate on that, um, from what I understand, Princeton's shade tree um, uh, ordinance came into play when a developer clear cut a lot and we did not have an ordinance in place for replacing the trees and that kind of got the local community um, motivated to put an ordinance in place so I would recommend uh, trying to do that before um, that happens so that just to reiterate um, if you don't have an ordinance I suggest um, getting one. <laughs> Last word. So I agree uh, with Lisa to plant trees, but just think that if you save some that are 120 or 100 years old or even 50, you're that many decades ahead. And there are magnitudes more carbon saved by uh, older growth forests and magnitudes more biodiversity in them. So I would recommend that everybody open your eyes, take responsibility for forests near you. It's not somebody else's responsibility to stand up and speak for the trees. We all need to look around in our neighborhoods and if there's a vacant lot or there's trees on it, look into what might be built there and see if you can maybe save that forest or that area. So let's stand up and look around and find some old trees and make sure they remain standing. That's great. And we will be running our community watershed advocate program again in January. So if there are community members uh, or students that you think would be interested, um, okay. please keep your eye out for that. And um, we will be sending a recording of this session along and um, Lisa's slides. So um, if those are of help to you, those will be resources as well.